level evaluation. Um, and really that's, that's who you tag as a unicorn right now. And across the world or globally, there's about 800 plus of them. And I even hear there's something called decacorns. Those are people that are like 10 billion and above. So you're talking about the stripes <laughs> and what have you, but we'll stick to unicorns for today. So let, let's work with that. Um, but yeah, it's any company that has a billion dollar um, valuation, uh, speci specifically a privately held company. And how, how do you feel unicornism in the entrepreneurial world? I mean, there are multiple arguments about this, right? Um, but ultimately, I think as, as more private investors come into the space, as more venture capitals and private equity firms um, put in money towards growing entrepreneurship, that's how people start getting more and more valuation into what their, what their companies are. The reason why I said there's a lot of argument or debate around this is because there's a separate conversation about whether this is a whole boom or inflated sense of you know valuation or whether it's something that's earned, especially when you think about some companies who were thought as unicorns and then when they went for their IPO, that's their public offering, their valuation was a bit lower. Um, but people actually get there by having high growth companies that there's a future potential for even more growth. Um, and because there's a lot more investment coming from private individuals um, into these companies, you find the valuation increasing over time. And another thing I really like about how people get to unicorn status is as other people become unicorns, they give back to other people to get them to become unicorns. So you'll find unicorn exited companies investing in younger companies to get them to become unicorns too. And that's my favorite part about um, how people get to become unicorns. Yeah, which is which is amazing. So there's there's a lot of hope in the community, despite that. The fact is that also that in real life, you know, it can be challenging for mainly in Africa to process many unicorns that are valued at one billion dollars, as you say. And I guess it can take a certain amount of time to produce hundreds and thousands of them. But the good news is that we also have like terms in the space, such as like uh, sunicorns, which is a new term that is used for companies that are on the way to become unicorns. And there are also like minicorns, which are like startups with a valuation of um, 1 million. And they are companies that are pretty new in the game, but they still have some valuation, which further proves that the company has potential of becoming a unicorn in the upcoming future. How do you feel about uh, the, the terms minicorns, uh, unicorns, and do you feel that it opens up the, 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 the space for more African startups to get into this process of the stages going to unicornism? Definitely. I mean, I guess they're all derivatives of the same unicorn thing, right? And I, as long as it, it comes up as some kind of aspiration for the people to, to want to attain, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I'm wary of many derivatives of a certain term because they might dilute the purpose or the weight of that. But right now, I mean, there's, for me, there's nothing to worry about. I think having things like sonicorns, like you mentioned, or minicorns just shows the path that a lot of other companies can take to get to unicorn. And I'm hoping that we then hear more terms like the decacorn I was mentioning before, which case the next one, I wonder what we will do. It will probably be like a degree to decagon instead of university to unicorn. Who knows? Um, but I'm here. For yes, <laughs> that, that would be. That would be interesting. And I've seen like uh, just a couple hours ago, I've seen like because it's live, it's fresh and it's dark here at the Africa FinTech Festival. I've seen that uh, we have indeed quite a lesser number of unicorns in Africa, but five out of seven tech unicorns in Africa come from the fintech space. And we've, we've been seeing like Africa that has been rushing, you know, in the in the fintech space, like rushing for funding and things like that. But we're seeing like the, the space opening in the sense that we are having like more fintech bets and uh, Africa fintech companies are raising more, you know, uh, over the last uh, couple of months that it has been in the, in the last decade. Um, do you feel that um, other continents or other VCs like are becoming more open to finding more unicorn potential in Africa? Um, I mean, there are multiple ways for me to answer that question. The short version would be yes, um, but it's also worth just walking through in some way the trends that we're seeing. So in the last five, 10 years, there's just been a lot more interest on companies coming out of the African continent. I think there's one part around, of course, the population. You've probably heard all the statistics about how we'll have the largest workforce in the world by 2035. And that is having that amount of talent in a space 
is a very ripe ground for growing companies and growing them at scale. Not only the talent that will work on the companies or build the companies, but also the people who would consume the things produced by these companies. So having more companies coming up that are creating solutions for Africans, by Africans in Africa, um, is just something that a lot more investors or people are willing to bet their money on. And in a very interesting way, COVID um, and everything that happened with the pandemic last year actually exacerbated a lot of the growth that we're seeing. So even if you look at the fintech space, for the first time in a very long time, um, a lot of African countries that were very dependent on cash economies couldn't go to banks because they were closed. So there had to be a rise in more companies coming up with innovative or creative ways where people could access their money and their funds. And to your statistics about how five out of seven companies um, that are unicorns in Africa are fintech companies, about three or four of those actually got to that stage within the first nine months of this year. So you can imagine how quickly that growth has happened. And people are seeing those trends and people are seeing that need and consumers are using this tool. So it just makes sense that if anybody's betting on where growth would be on the continent, especially with startups in the next couple of years, they should be betting on fintech companies. Yes, definitely. It's opening up in the space. And as you've been mentioning, like, I feel that uh, from the stats that have been uh, published in the past, it's like Afri Africa, African fintech companies have raised more in the first seven months that they have in the decade before. And between January and September of this year alone, like uh, African fintech companies have reached a touch near 1.5 billion. And that's against like 1.06 billion that they raised across over the, from like 2011 to 2020, which means that there is a clear interest, there is a clear indication of an accelerated interest in the market potential of fintech in Africa. And when I look at examples of uh, tech unicorns like uh, Fari in Egypt, Ope in Nigeria, Wave in Senegal, Flute Wave, which is also from Nigeria, even uh, there is like even into switch from Nigeria. A, lo a lot of uh, a lot of them actually come from Nigeria, which is like I'm just here space, to say, like, if you're looking to invest <laughs> in Africa, you should be coming to my country. So you know, Nigeria <laughs> is the way to go, apparently. And then even beyond, you know, the unicorns that are getting that valuation. Think about what I say, unicorn adjacent, like Paystack, for example, that recently got acquired by Stripe, who is considered a decagon, right? So um, sure, the income valuation is one way to do it, but investing in these companies that is just a good way to accelerate their growth and also get yourself some nice um, return on investment. So I imagine there are a lot of happy people who invested in Paystack early on who are just, you know, probably buying a whole island somewhere right now. So those are some <laughs> other ways that, you know, the investment in FinTech has, has helped the economy and individuals as well. Definitely. And all the elements that you mentioned um, cannot happen without the entrepreneurial mindset. And it tallies so well as, as because like when we speak about the mindset, we also speak about culture and these cultures are actually geared towards cultivating the critical thinking, encouraging the capacity to innovate. Because at the end of the day, every startup aspires to become successful one day. But um, tell us more about how is this culture made possible for entrepreneurs at ALX? Mm. So I, I would actually start by thinking about the role of education in multiple forms in supporting entrepreneurs and getting them to this stage. So when you think about a lot of these companies that are unicorns right now, or just entrepreneurs in general, I was reading this thing by Antler, they're a company that accelerates or an accelerator for a lot of startups across the world. And they were saying of these unicorns, 90% of them have at least a university degree. And that means these people went through school. I don't know how much the university contributed to what they were doing. I'm hoping it did. But I do think there's a space for deliberately thinking about the role of universities in supporting entrepreneurship and getting people to unicorn status. A lot of entrepreneurs I've had conversations with, and of course, please don't quote me on the statistic side of this. This is all anecdotal to an extent. I've learned about their entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial ventures on the streets, for lack of better words, right? It wasn't a formal thing that was taught to them. And I think if we're able to incorporate a lot more of these in whatever our university education systems are preaching and teaching, we might have a higher chance of having more successful companies because 
one thing I see universities do is give people a safe space to try and fail forward. You're still in a, at a point in your life where your parents are still taking care of you to an extent for some people. Um, or the expectation is that you're still learning. So the pressure on you is a lot less. Imagine that we had more Stanford, you know, startup labs or Harvard startup labs or MIT startup labs across the continent. I know that there are more universities doing this, like Stellenbosch in, um, in South Africa, like African Leadership University, shameless plug here, um, among others. And I think even Covenant University in Nigeria also does something like this. But I don't think it should be one off. I think it should be something that's ingrained across what universities teach. And using to your direct question to me, you know, the role that ALX and the African Leadership Group more broadly has played in entrepreneurship. When we think about our mission, it's to develop the next generation of ethical and entrepreneurial leaders. And we want to get 3 million of those by 2030. And what we've done is basically into almost everything that we do. Entrepreneurship and just that all the students go through to the African Leadership University, where everybody goes through entrepreneurial leadership as well. And there's a student ventures program to give people that taste of what entrepreneurship means. And you know, we just continue that even beyond to what we're doing at the room, um, where we have a young entrepreneurs program for Africans to come through. And actually, we're launching our next um, program in November. So if anybody's listening and wants to launch their business, you should be following me and what we're doing at the room. Wonderful, wonderful. I think I think it's um these are really great elements that you are incorporating actually to grow, you know, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I feel that what you said about the educational system is so important because um that there's someone named William Bygrave who said that the entrepreneurial process is a set of stages and events that follow one another. So which means that um, from the idea or the conception of a business, you know, that even that triggers the operations, the implementation and growth uh, depends on a lot of things and a lot of factors. And uh, throughout the educational um, university process like I, I was like a recipient of the gsl program in tech entrepreneurship i was a non-tech at that time um and uh it, it was an amazing program but it made us realize also again that from idea to prototyping ideation to prototyping a lot of things can happen in between and we may have to revamp and things like that so i believe that uh you mentioned the the importance like of failing forward, which is um, such a positive aspect that has to be implemented in the educational system. I think it, it's important that universities open up the space for young people or those who are studying there to understand that it's important to to be to learn to be comfortable with taking more risks and failing forward because it's never a straight line. It's never going to to happen, you know. Mini-chronism and things like that. There are always different uh, stages to this. Tell me something, um, Tolu. How do you feel that um, the, the educational system, like in Africa, can be improved? Like, if we have to move from you know the traditional subjects for an, and, and seeing like for an entrepreneurial lens, and uh, for those especially that that have studied you know traditional fields, how can they actually become in more like entrepreneurial savvy. I'll answer that in two ways. I think there's one part of this where we're speaking to universities and what they can incorporate um, to make sure that there's a lot of entrepreneurship and innovation going on. And I wouldn't necessarily say to scrap what already exists. I would say to, you know, go with the times and build on what already exists. So a very low hanging fruits could be having a lot more startup labs, entrepreneurship clubs within schools um, and making that priority where people can see that as a viable way of advancing their career. There could be inviting past alumni of universities to come speak and mentor people. Because one thing I see that is super helpful is that when young people see role models and examples of successful people in multiple fields, they are more encouraged to take that risk because it seems there's a clear path for them to go through. Another thing I'll say is think about 
skills that are derivative of a good entrepreneur and infuse that into the existing curriculum within universities. So you're looking for people that have grit and resilience. That means they don't just like, they don't break when a small challenge comes to them. You're looking for people who are problem solvers, who see problems and challenges as opportunities. How can we infuse that into the day-to-day curriculum that's already being delivered such that whether or not a person ends up being an entrepreneur, like you mentioned earlier, they have that entrepreneurial mindset they can carry along. And why this is important is because you'll see two things. There's one part where not all entrepreneurs got it right the first time. So if you look at whether it's the founders of Paystack or Flutterway or OK, if you look back at their records, it probably wasn't their first rodeo. This wasn't the first time they had tried to start a business. This is the one that we've heard about. And you know how they jokingly say like overnight success takes about five years in the making. Like you just see the overnight success. Oh, wow, they raised this money. You don't know what happened behind the scenes. And I I emphasize this because that somebody doesn't come out of university immediately being an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial unicorn doesn't mean that they wouldn't over time. So even on average, this unicorn started their businesses at 29. um, And that's because they've had the practice over time to get to this point and incorporate all their learnings in it. So first part of this is universities finding out ways to incorporate the core skills, traits, characteristics of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial innovative thinkers into the existing curriculum and create spaces where they can also create, (laughs) to sound a bit redundant on that. So clubs, and other mentorship activities within the schools. The second part is for those like me who are now out of school and have missed that boat, there are so many other enablers in the education and entrepreneurship ecosystem that have popped up. So I would say definitely leverage those. The room is one of those, so I'll keep shamelessly plugging us. But then there are so many others that you can look at, right? The accelerators that pop up, the startup school from Y Combinator. People like this are trying to, or initiatives like this are trying to increase the number of entrepreneurs um, that are out there, even though it seems like you've missed the mark from the university side of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of all these enablers, actually, because it, it's true that um, a, a lot of entrepreneurs like have actually dropped out from college or from universities, and some didn't even attend formal uh, academic universities, but it's only like when they launched themselves that afterwards they decided like to resume university courses. So it's important to uh, make space and be inclusive of different types of profiles and things like that. I know programmers, um, highly qualified programmers who started from scratch and never went to university, but then it's only after like several years into the coding and things like that, that they decided, okay, now we want like to acquire more formal um, university education. But it's true that at the, at the same time, you know, a, a formal degree that may have been obtained like 20 years ago in tech may not be relevant. And relevance is so important today in terms of skills and competences, because um, things that we may have studied in the past, uh, especially in the fintech world, which is moving so fast, may not no more like be relevant. And I feel that it's important also for uh, traditional universities to to move towards um, the the space of uh, certifications or specializations, for example, more in like uh, what the fintech field offers, whether in prop tech, in insurance tech, and all the different payment uh, infrastructures that are important because if we want to have a generation of entrepreneurs that um, thrive in the tech world, in the fintech world, it, it's important to allow these specializations in the formal curriculum to, to stand out. How do you feel about this still? i mixed. i mixed because I, I think about how <laughs> I saw this thing recently where they said the first astronaut didn't want to be an astronaut when they grew up because there were no astronauts to begin with. Right? And I think by virtue of the way education is structured as being finite, it means that whenever you graduate, a lot of the things you learn in the next five, 10 years become obsolete. So even if universities are to incorporate these certifications and newer learnings, which I think is a really good thing to do, there's probably a greater job that universities can do. And I think they're the best place to do this because they get people very early on where they're still young and fresh and their minds are fertile to learn new things. And one of the big things that a university can teach is how people can learn. And that's not a skill that you can entirely, you know, put in a box in a tangible way. It's not something that you can necessarily give a certification for, but it's a life skill that is so essential. It's very important to 
show people how to learn because as the world changes, as things improve, because now there's cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, like in university, when I went to school, none of that existed. Now I've read up so much about it, either from entrepreneurs who are also just supporting with the learning and education or by being on Google and YouTube way longer than I should be. But I wouldn't go back to school right now to learn cryptocurrency just because that's not the career path I want to be on. And that's okay. But having experienced the university system or a learning system that taught me how to learn, how to find information, how to use that to my advantage and create things from it. That's one key role I think universities can play. How do you teach people in your universities, your students, how do you teach them how to learn for the world that doesn't even exist yet? Because that's going to happen and that's okay. Right. And I feel that uh, a critical factor that uh, drives the development of uh, startups at each stage is, is this most like with the human behavior, the entrepreneurial traits are shaped by the personal attributes, the driving force, but the environment as well. And speaking of challenges, I feel that uh, if, if I take the example of two, com two local companies in Mauritius like uh, MIPS, uh, which is in the payment uh, infrastructure and uh, another one named Funkis, which is a lending and crowdfunding uh, platform. I feel that uh, the, the challenges for these local companies for several years has been like uh, finding the resilience to deal with um, the compliance and regulations, which means that uh, whatever the university degree, whatever like be the skills, the tailing and things like that, there's going to be challenges that uh, entrepreneurs will have to face in this journey. What are the other challenges that you feel African entrepreneurs or university graduates are actually encountering? That is a fully loaded question. And I don't know how much of that we'll cover in the rest of the time that we have. But some of the things that I've seen as challenges um, from a company perspective is, like you mentioned, the regulation. It's increasingly more important to have support from governments and other regulatory bodies to make sure that entrepreneurship thrives and is, is given a space to grow. Um, because, I mean, you've probably also seen all of the news about how much entrepreneurs and small businesses and startups contribute to the GDP and economy and job creation in the place. So giving them the options for um, whether it's tax rebates or a smooth regulatory space is very important. Another challenge I see them face, and to your point about, you know, what universities are, are bringing out when or are graduating, is churning out more talents that knows how to thrive in new and innovative spaces. So I hear a lot of people talk about how they have all of these roles to fill and not enough talent to fill the spaces. So there's just one around finding the right people to work with. Um, another thing I see is just entrepreneurship can be really lonely, even though there are a lot of entrepreneurs. Everybody thinks that what they're working on is really unique and they're going through the problem for the first time themselves. So having more communities of like-minded entrepreneurs who can keep each other accountable, share best practices, learn from each other are some of the things that I've, I've heard and seen. And if I don't mention funding, I feel like people are going to call me out on this one. So there's also the space <laughs> of funding and how much um, money is going into that space um, for the entrepreneurs. Yes, funding and funding and scaling up uh, are the big things actually. But uh, beyond university, like let's say having planted entrepreneurial seeds at the university level, how uh, can we nurture young entrepreneurs to help them reach their unicorn aspirations? If we take a talent development angle, you know, what do you feel? Uh, what what type of support is needed? You know, in the in the African context, would it be like uh, coaching, uh, mentoring, uh, upskilling, networking? How do you feel like uh, the room is making this happen? Okay, I, I guess this is my my five minute pitch on the room, which I can definitely do. I see that we need to wrap up soon, though, so I'll make this really quick. Um, so at the room, one thing we're doing is gathering the most extraordinary people who want to share the talents and skills they have and also learn from others. So we have a space for entrepreneurs, young professionals, mid-career professionals to meet. And we offer a community experience, a learning experience, and just a supportive environment for, for each of these to achieve their goal and their potential. Some ways we do that is through getting successful people to come in and speak about the work that they've done and even serve as sometimes coaches and mentors to people um, who are also learning. Uh, we have, I mean, we have a history of learning and development. So we also think about how to structure the experience for people to get from where they are to where they want to go. 
and we connect them with a high caliber peer community. Because we think if you put really exceptional people in a room, magic happens by itself. Um, so we are being very intentional about how we invite people into a space where they can collaborate, learn from each other, and build really magical things together. So check us out at theroom.com. It's very easy to remember. Wonderful. <laughs> So like to, to sum up, like moving from, you know, a minicorn to a sunicorn to a unicorn, I feel that the attitudes of entrepreneurs are those that are shaping their own surroundings. Like if an entrepreneur looks for the characteristics of successful people, the changes of success increase, especially if they belong to an entrepreneur ecosystem and I feel that uh, what the room is doing is also like to accelerate this entrepreneurial ecosystem over Africa and um, this is actually a, a very important attribute because uh, human behavior can be shaped by the environment and it again it's not it's never a straight line it, it's a series of events it's a series of stages of processes that, that trigger you know this this uh, mindset of growth mindset of going towards uh, unicornism, uh, a law specific word on this aspect, Tulu. Um, I mean, I would just tell people to to do things, do things afraid, just take have the courage to make your dreams come true. There are so many people rooting for you, and there's so many initiatives trying to help you reach your goal. Don't it's okay to be afraid in that, but still do it afraid. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for this. Thanks so much, uh, live Selena. Advice. It's been a pleasure. And obviously, there are a lot of juicy opportunities for entrepreneurs in the fintech space in Africa. And it's important to belong to the community and in an entrepreneurial ecosystem that fosters growth and development. On this, uh, thank you so much, participants and attendees. Uh, you can ask your, Q your Q&As directly uh, on the shop platforms or for our LinkedIn profiles. We'll be happy to answer them. Um, on LinkedIn. Thank you so much and over Thank to you, you for the other sessions, Africa Fintech Festival.